Thank you, Williams. Okay, my name is Kurash Parivar. I am uh, a clinical pharmacologist. Uh, my basic training is in pharmacy. I completed my pharmacy training in Uppsala University in Sweden. And I did a postgraduate in kinetics at the UCSF. Uh, completed my training in 1989. And since then I've been uh, working for 22 years in clinical pharmacology at different pharma companies, uh, AstraZeneca, Pharmacia, and currently at Pfizer. Yeah, um, the training today I am doing uh, in behalf of myself. I'm not representing my company. So uh, yeah, I was asked to give you a course in um, clinical trials with the focus in phase two setting. So um, with that, um, I would like to uh, start with my lecture. Just a, um, a quick notice about trials. Uh, I believe that most of you have been uh, exposed to clinical trials in some form or fashion. But uh, generally speaking, uh, it's, a, it's a controlled experiment. Uh, we try to control the setting of the experiment as much as we can in order to um, exclude confounding factors so that any findings observed in that setting of that study could be directly attributed to the actual the product rather than just from a bias or other findings. If we look at the uh, drug development per se, um, and again, some of you may have been uh, exposed to different um, um, information about, uh, about drug development, but the, um, yeah, we usually break it down in different phases, phase one to phase four. Yeah, each phase, each bucket has its own yeah, primary objective. Uh, if you look at the phase one, you could see that the, um, um, there are a few primary objectives of phase one studies. Yeah, one of them would be uh, to identify the maximum tolerated dose. The second one would be to characterize the kinetics and dynamics of the compound. And thirdly would be to characterize the safety profile of the, pro of, of the compound. These are the primary objective of, the, of, the, uh, of that segment of drug development. It doesn't mean that you can't do more, but, but these are the primary objectives. You try to identify these three objectives first, and then if there are any other objectives as secondary objectives, you will add on. The, um, when you uh, complete your phase one, uh, your, your process proceeds to phase two, which will be uh, my focus of uh, discussion today, and then in phase two, yeah, again, the primary objective of phase two would be to establish proof of concept and to characterize the dose response or exposure response. And by response, I mean either the uh, expected response in form of efficacy or the unwanted response in the form of side effects. So we try to establish a correlation between them. Yeah, and also to identify the doses that we are eventually going to test in the phase three setting. So phase two, in my opinion, is a, one of the most important yeah, area of drug development. Yeah, that, that's an area that you need to really identify if you have a viable product or not. Yeah. After phase two comes phase three. And as you can see, the main objective of the phase three is uh, to confirm the safety and efficacy of the product. And again, with the focus on confirming. Yeah, you really need to know if you have a product before coming to phase three. In phase three, you just add larger number of population of the target population and try to confirm what you've already seen in phase two setting. After phase one, two, and three is completed, you usually put together a submission package, put the package into regulatory agencies across the world, that being FDA or MEA or yeah, KFDA in Korea or SFDA in China and so forth, and apply for an approval. The process will take uh, X number of months, and then hopefully you will be uh, awarded uh, an approval to market your product in that market. After which the phase four comes on board. In the context of discussion with regulatory agencies, uh, many times you end up with um, a negotiation after which you may uh, be requested by regulatory agency to do X number of additional number of studies, and we call them post-approval commitments. Yeah, those studies are, uh, are performed after the approval is given. Product enhancement studies is the studies that the companies undertake uh, in the form of, uh, for instance, if you have a drug for which you are using an immediate release product, you are giving it two or three times a day, that's not that convenient for a patient, but you know by virtue of pharmaceutical sciences that, that you can give this drug yeah, so that the drug could be, um, yeah, 
yeah, having an effect across the whole GI tract, all the way down to colon. So, by, and then when you know that one, then you can develop what we call a sustained release, a control release formulation for that one. And by help of that one, the drug can be given just once a day to the patient instead of three times a day. So those type of product uh, studies are product enhancement studies. And of course, the last one would be drug-drug interaction studies. We do perform a number of drug-drug interaction studies uh, during the, uh, the actual phase one, two, or three. Yeah, but yeah, after registration of product, when it comes to real market, when you see uh, when products being used by yeah, large, much, much larger population of patients, you may end up getting additional requests for additional drug-drug interaction studies and those studies are performed in the phase four setting. Yeah, in the bottom part, I've yeah, tried to give you an idea about the number of patients or subjects that you see usually in the phase one to phase three. And in phase one setting, you um, usually see about 20 to 100 healthy volunteers or patients. Yeah, the length could be several months. In phase two, the number of uh, subjects or patients you see is about up to several hundreds and it could take as uh, short as uh, four weeks to six weeks, or it could be as long as two years. Usually oncology studies are the ones we are long in, in, in duration. It may, may take you two years to recruit all the patients you need for your study. And in phase three setting, it could be again from 100 patient to higher, yeah, and it could be a lot, lot more patients needed for that one. Yeah, and again, in, in, in therapeutic areas where you have difficult access to patients because of the prevalence of disease is smaller, you end up with smaller phase three studies, but in other therapeutic areas such as CVMED and cardiovascular, for instance, in order to do a, a present the drug to the market, you may need to do studies as big as 5,000 or 6,000 patients in order to ascertain safety and efficacy of the product. So why do we conduct phase two studies? Um, the purpose of phase two studies is um, yeah, a filtering um, tool. Yeah, you want to make sure the product that you are sending to phase three has appropriate uh, efficacy and safety. Yeah, it's a filter. If the filter is too porous, you're sending too, too many products to phase three, yeah, products which may not have the characteristics for success, and thereby, and thereby they may very well fail in phase three. And if the filter you put in phase two is too tight, you may be killing too many programs, even the programs that may have had the chance to succeed in phase three setting. So it's a pretty difficult balance, very good to where you put your hurdle. If your hurdle is too low, it's too easy to jump over it. If your hurdle is too high, it's difficult to pass it. Yeah, and, that, and there is, comes this balance between success in phase two and success in phase three. And if your hurdle is too low, you have too many programs succeeding in phase two, they go to phase three and fail. If the hurdle is too high, again, your, your, uh, your um, success in phase three will be high because the programs, the few which passes the hurdle go phase three, they succeed by, 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 by you're running the chance of actually killing good products. And, and, and that's, that's the tricky part of phase two, it's design. Um, yeah, there are two stages in phase two, phase two A and phase two B. Uh, phase two A is the first, first kind of a step after phase one. Uh, during which you just take the highest dose that you can give to the patient, the maximum safe dose, MTD. And uh, you uh, give a two-arm study, you, your test study, test product at maximum dose, and then you take the standard of care, the product which is already on the market for treatment of the patients, you test them against each other. If you succeed, uh, then you go to phase 2B. If you don't succeed, then you don't go to phase 2B. The product will, will die and then will get terminated there. Phase 2B would be uh, when you already know your product works, but the dose that you tested in phase 2A was the maximum dose given to the patient. You may not need to give the maximum dose to get efficacy. You may, get, um, you may be able to give a lower dose, uh, obtain efficacy, but, more, but more, more milder side effects. So that's why in the phase 2B setting, you do a multi-arm study. You test the uh, different doses of your product, the test product, again against the standard of care, a product which is already in the market. So, uh, and by virtue of that one, you will find out which one of the tested doses of your test product is the best dose to be given to the patient. And I will come back on that a bit later on about the design of phase two studies. 